Hi, yes. So I am Mary Maluccio. I run the program in New Orleans, and I am a partner of Dr. Boudreaux's. But I won't give him any special treatment because he doesn't need that at all. Um, and so we were just, and so if anyone has any other questions, we sort of do open it up. And then some of the questions I put into the afternoon session because I think that, um, that they would be better off as sort of more general stuff. Um, and then if there's anything that we don't cover, then by all means during lunch or things like that, feel free to, to just um, track down the people. Okay, so really, Andrew, Andrew Marsala. <laughs> There are like 18 questions for you. So I thought that maybe you just like, in response to the first question, second question, third question, and fourth question, I can just give you a whole overview. So, but a couple things that I think are important because liver directed therapies are a really common um, treatment for patients with metastatic neuroendocrine, regardless of whether or not their pancreas um, versus, uh, versus a small bowel and even some bronchopulmonaries. So, but you mentioned some stuff, okay? So, one, the difference between going through the wrist and the thigh, okay? Side effects associated with chemo embolization that people would be aware of uh, going um, you know, into it. And then how do you decide within your multidisciplinary team who would go, who would be a really good candidate for liver direct therapies? Testing. Cool. Um, great questions. Um, so when we're doing an angiogram, uh, for any reason, our, our main goal is to get access to the arteries in the abdomen. You can do that from the groin. There's a femoral artery there, which is that's sort of the conventional technique. Um, I'm very comfortable with that. I think most of us are. We all have to learn how to do that. Uh, you can also go through a small artery in the wrist called the radial artery, but not everybody is a candidate for radial access, depending on how big that artery is and what their blood flow to their hand is like. Um, the, the room setup can also be a little bit more cumbersome. So um, you have to basically just kind of have the patient's arm out to the side. And, and for, it's really from a technical standpoint that, that you can do the same thing, right? So some folks will get a radial procedure and some folks will get a femoral procedure and it depends on the operator and it depends on how the room is set up. Um, and the recovery is, um, you know, from a, for a femoral access, you gotta lie flat on your back for two hours. For a radial access, you can sit up in a chair, but you do have to be careful with the wrist until that is that uh, access is closed. So. Um, so we, we can do both. And uh, more often than not, we do femoral because that's how our rooms are set up and that's what we're fastest at. So there is, um, there's some good reason to do what you are best at and do what you are fastest at because the longer you spend farting around in a procedure, um, the more likely you are to have complications. So um, that's how we typically do it at VUMC. But we do and can do a radial access for certain patients. Um, and then the other question was side effects, right? Yep, side effects of taste. Okay, so side effects. Side effects are it's post embolic syndrome is is the thing we talk about most commonly, and uh, and that can happen anytime you do an embolic procedure anywhere in the body. Um, and it, again, it's it's a spectrum from really mild, non-existent to more significant, um, and we never know how a patient's going to be. I've done. Um, big pr big embolizations on little old ladies, and they are they're fine. They're like they're like, oh yeah, did you do anything, honey? And I'm like, yeah, I, I did. And um, <laughs> and and you know, they, they do great. And then you do um, small embolizations on big biker dudes with no offense to any bikers, big biker dudes, lots of tattoos, um, and, and and they're hurting. And so, you know, we just don't know who's going to hurt, who's going to have nausea and vomiting. Um, and so it can be difficult to predict. But um, I'd say in my mind, I've divided it up into thirds. I think about a third of patients have pretty mild symptoms. About a third of patients have moderate symptoms. They can still go home the same day. And then a third of patients have more significant symptoms and they stay in the hospital for a night. Um, and that's been my own clinical practice. Um, other symptoms that can stick around, which we didn't talk about, uh, doxorubicin and mitomycin C are chemotherapeutic agents. Um, they, can, um, they can make you feel tired. For a few weeks, you know, and they can affect your appetite. Um, they're not going to cause hair loss because we're not giving them repeatedly. So I don't have anybody complain of hair loss. I've never complained of hair loss, but I do have patients come to me and say, "Yeah, I was pretty run down for a few weeks, and um, you know, I felt um, like I didn't want to eat anything." And so that's going to be a symptom of the of the um, chemotherapy drugs that we administer. They're not huge doses; they're one-time doses you get during the procedure, but it takes a little while for your body to work through it. Um, with radio embolization where you're not administering chemotherapy, those patients, tend, the, those, the damage is done with the radioactive particles. And so we just 
we just basically are in embedding those particles inside the tumor. So those patients have pretty mild side effects right at the beginning. They don't need to stay in the hospital overnight. They go home. They're not hurting very bad. But what can happen is a, they start to get fatigue, pretty significant fatigue within a few days, and that can linger for a few weeks as well. And that's a radiation-induced injury, and your body's recovering from it. And so that's, that's common. And it's, if you get radiation to the spine or to the head and neck or to any other part of your body, that's a, that's a pretty common side effect with any radiation. Um, what else was the third question? Oh, no, that was good. Oh, yeah. great. And then, okay. and then in answer to the, to the mapping uh, question, so for chemo embolization or bland embolization, it's all done in real time. He's mm -hmm. literally doing it and deciding how he's going to shoot those microspheres. Mapping procedures are predominantly for the yttrium 90 or the radio embolization procedures. That's because the liver's like a sieve, and we can't have those particles going anywhere else. And we, we don't. So it, it's... I think he really nicely said most of the neuroendocrine subspecialty centers are leaning well away from radioembolization because PRRT is so relevant in neuroendocrine, but it's not like we never do it. We do it in some of the higher grade tumors. We do it when we're trying to, to, to block off significant um, regional thing, but the one complicating factor of a radioembolization, you have to have a mapping procedure and then you have to come back like 10 mm -hmm. days later for the actual procedure, but for the vast majority, he's literally doing it in real time yeah. and sort of judging how much he and his experience can do in, in one setting. Yeah. Can I add one thing? Oh, of course you can. Radioembolization requires a lot of procedure planning. Um, with radioembolization, you get one shot. You deliver the medicine, you got to deliver to the right amount, to the right spot, and you don't want it to go anywhere you don't want it to go. So you got to be really careful with those. But it works great when you do everything correctly. Um, and so we have really stringent protocols on how we do those procedures. It works really well. Um, and we do it a lot with hepatocellular carcinoma, with, you know, with, with other tumor types. We do it quite a bit. But she's absolutely right. you got to, or absolutely right, you have to be careful with it. Um, it just takes more prep. Um, and the dose has to be made for you. So that's another thing. So, like, so I do my mapping procedure. I, get, uh, I make plans for how I'm going to treat you, but then I have to order the dose. It's got to be manufactured for you and then mailed down to us, and that takes some time. Whereas with, um, radio, with uh, chemotherapy, they just, they just mix it in the pharmacy and deliver it right to me. So, and I can give that sort of a la carte, if you will. Great. So to the, um, for the surgeons in particular, so Dr. Boudreau, you, you did the um, sort of the mid-gut and the peritoneal stuff. So questions about inoperability, he's got actually a really great talk. I have links to those, those talks, but he gives a great talk on inoperability being in the eye of the operator. But that can you operate on tumors of the peritoneum with a lot of the techniques that you described because this person's doctor is saying that they are quote unquote inoperable. And then secondly to in, in your area was that what are the types of things that would lead you towards feeling that something is associated with a bowel obstruction versus it just being related to carcinoid syndrome and some of the symptoms that are associated with the intestinal manifestations of that? And which technique then would you use to try to figure out whether or not something is, is an operable problem like a bowel obstruction? How much time do you have? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll give them the link to your talk. <laughs> okay, so the first one was, how do you address the problem of you're told by your doctor you're inoperable? So it probably means it's time to get, at least get one more second opinion. And sometimes you need to get your second opinion first. So um, seek out a multidisciplinary program that has experience in doing these complex procedures. Because, I, I mean, I've seen patients who were told they were inoperable by the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, Sloan Kettering, Cedar sinai MD Anderson, a place in this town I heard of has got a name <laughs> with a V. But, I mean, it's just, it's just a reality of the thing. And the problem is many of the people who say a person is inoperable aren't surgeons. They don't do that operation. And they apply... The traditional training in metastatic cancer care, and they translate it to this disease because you are what you eat. And if you're an oncologist practicing in the community and you're taking care of people with metastatic lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, melanoma, bone cancer, I mean, you pick, pick a cancer, a pancreatic cancer that's not neuroendocrine, in general, your options for operating on those patients are very limited once it's spread outside the primary site. There are very specific indications where an operation will help 
those patients, but that's the major minority of cases. So they are deemed inoperable and you're relegated to non-operative methods of liver-directed therapies and chemotherapies and stuff like that. This disease is different. And so you kind of are what you eat. And if that's what you're mostly seeing, because most, I think most practicing oncologists aren't going to have a hundred like you. They might have two or one, right? And so it's not their fault. It's just what they're used to and how their brain works. But that's why I think it really behooves one to get outside of your sphere and go seek out, you know, people that do this kind of all day every day and get their opinion and in a multidisciplinary setting to see because maybe maybe surgery is or isn't the answer but it may be the answer is surgery is not for you right now but it may be down the line after we take care of this problem that problem the other problem and some other stuff not the least of which is nutritional rescue um, like um, like Cameron was saying that the decision to take someone to the operating room it's not just based on the patient's age. People are like cars. It's not the year it was made, it's the mileage. And so some people are high mileage and you have to figure out how can you overcome the effects of that? Are those problems surmountable and can you get around that hurdle without doing more harm than good? So that's, that's the part that's really kind of the art part, not the science part. Uh, in terms of parsing out for instance, let's say the two most common things I see between a partial bowel obstruction and pancreatic insufficiency. I mean, I came this close to taking somebody to the operating room until I figured out that pancreatic insufficiency had gotten worse because somebody had switched their enzyme preparation from one brand to another brand and it wasn't working as good. And they would blow up every time they ate a meal and got all gassy and crampy and miserable looking. So uh, if a person has a tumor of the gut and it's still in the gut, you have to think uh, one out of three of those people is going to have a bowel obstruction in that presentation. It may not be diagnosed and it may be partial. The other thing that the bowel will do is this thing called intersusception. The little tumor in the bowel acts like a lead point. Like when you take your sock inside out, the bowel peristalsis and one piece of bowel kind of sleeves inside another piece and, and then they hurt and they cramp and they look pretty bad and they get swollen and then it pops back out and they feel better. And it goes away. And the scans don't show anything and everything looks okay. And people say, oh, well, you know, you just had a bug or something and go home. And this can happen a few times until one time maybe it goes in there and gets stuck and then they end up in the operating room for a bowel obstruction and they say, oh, look at that. So the, in general, people that have pancreatic insufficiency as a result of their uh, either lanreotide or sandosatin or octreotide, in general, the symptoms are worse right after the shot. You get a lot more bloating and cramping and diarrhea because that's when you have the highest levels on board and about a third of patients are going to not make enough enzymes to properly digest your food and so the fats in the food get broken down to basically like castor oil and acts like more like a cathartic than something you can absorb and it makes you generate a lot of gas and the gas is hydrogen sulfide gas which is rotten egg smell. It lights up the house. So the fix is then get on some enzymes and you have to take a right amount in the right time. You have to take them at the beginning of the meal and take some more halfway through the meal so it mixes with the food with every meal. If you're going to eat a higher fat content meal, take more enzymes. If you're lesser low fat Mediterranean diet, maybe you can get away with less enzymes. So that's one way to help parse it out. But if people that have recurring symptoms every time they eat, you have to at least think about that there may be a partial bowel obstruction going on to try and, and sometimes it's both. Then it's really kind of complicated. They have, you know, they have a partial bowel obstruction and they have pancreatic insufficiency. So, um, that's kind so of, you're telling us that it's complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. yeah. But right. in general, I think that it is, if the things keep recurring, recurring, then we lean towards it, it likely being related to yeah, a partial bowel try all the maneuvers to take care of bile salt induced diarrhea, pancreatic insufficiency, and all the other things we do to try and kind of calm the beast of the GI tract and all of that's failing then it's probably worthwhile doing some type of uh, studies and what we'll do is CT enterography or MRI enterography and sometimes we'll see a pinch point or a kink in the bowel somewhere and say aha that's probably the problem. Other times you end up just having to go to the operating room and find out uh, and see if that's what the problem is. Uh 
Uh-huh. Were you trying to point at that that would be a sign of pancreatic, pancreatic insufficiency? Condition. And if that gets better and kind of goes away right before the shot, okay. you know, and then it starts again, with it's cyclical every time you get the injection. Now, if persons are having worsening symptoms with carcinoid syndrome, diarrhea and flushing or palpitations or ain't and all of that stuff, and that's worse right before the next shot, then it may be you're inadequately or subtherapeutic on your injection and need either bigger dose or more often or take rescue shots of short-acting octreotide until you get your big shot, the once a month shot. So and this is all pretty much people that are syndromic with, that have a, you know, their tumors make stuff that has GI effects. And so you can try to, by looking at timing and looking at the food diary and keeping track of things, that's why working with the nutritionist is important to see is there some cyclical pattern to this? Is it a side effect of the medication? Is it because of some other underlying condition that can be medicated? Or is it a surgical problem? And, and sometimes it's a combination. And that's, that's when it's a little bit hard to parse out. Okay, yes, so, um, so we, have, we have the convenience of having three of the Lego pieces from, uh, from Vanderbilt, so I figured that we could, we could watch them all duke it out to answer this question. So when you guys are, are looking at each individual case, and I think the, each of the speakers, and I think that, that Dr. Ramirez will, will probably go into the complexities, especially with bronchopulmonaries in, this afternoon, but when you're sitting there at tumor board, how do you select which patients are better for the IR approach versus surgical cytoreduction? How do those conversations go at tumor board, gang? They're, they're polite. <laughs> <laughs> really are. Well, we know, I, I'm gonna give this to them in just a second, but they know that, um, I think we all know that we have something to offer. Um, there are definitely some patients who are better surgical candidates um, and obviously, um, I, I'm of the opinion that if a patient is a better surgical candidate, they need surgery. Um, that's a consequence of me having worked with Boudreaux for so many years. Um, I worked with Boudreaux for five years, so, um, and, and he taught me that. So I really believe that. So the, the unfortunate thing is not everybody is a surgical candidate. Or they were, they get surgery, but then they recur. And so we have to dig into our toolkit and go for the other things. And so. Um, you know, that's why the conversations are polite is because I think we have something to offer. Everybody has something to offer. I, I would just say, um, you know, uh, Phil touched on something that's very important. And, and I don't know <clears throat> how many, you know, I, I worked with Phil for, for many years as well. And sort of, um, so he's, he taught me this and instilled this into me. So as a medical oncologist in many of our other cancers, so such as lung cancer or, or others, once that tumor has spread to, to other organs, it's no longer, you're, you're usually not a candidate for surgery, especially if there's multiple sites of disease. Um, <clears throat> this, this disease is much different, as, as you've learned today. And, and realistically, a lot of times, you know, I'm the first person somebody sees with this disease. Uh, and I, I, you know, this is, pretty much all I do. Uh, so if you're going to a general oncologist where, where they see everything, they see breast and lung and colon, you know, the, the general teaching is, all right, well, once that cancer spreads, you're not a candidate for surgery. Uh, but I always say, you know, you know I, I always bring it to my surgeons and bring it to my team and, and because I'm not a surgeon and I don't know, you know, if, this, if, if you're a candidate for surgery or not. That's not my that's not my job to say, you're not a candidate for surgery. I let my surgeons tell me, you're not a candidate. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, we, yes, we meet every week and Emily's gonna talk more about this later on uh, today and kind of go through the ins and outs of what we, what we discuss, but it's, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, we, we have a very robust discussion in our, in our meetings every week and, and sort of make these decisions about, um, uh, who's a candidate, who's not a candidate. And, and, and many times uh, Cameron will say, I don't know if they're a candidate, but let me see them. And, uh, and so, so we, you know, we all work together and, uh, uh, and sometimes it's multiple different steps. Sometimes it's uh, you know, embolization first and sometimes it's surgery first or we'll go back and you know, this, you're in for the long journey with, with this disease. Uh, so, so you'll probably be meeting all of us at, at, at some point uh, dur during this journey. So. 
And so how about ca ca Cameron going in on a, on a, some surgical, sur just to keep it equal. And so um, since you did Pank and, and Phil Boudreau did, did small bowel, because it really does come down to sort of the primary site, the extended disease, you did mention the 70%. I can't remember. Phil probably mentioned the 70%. So, so what is it that we're looking for when you're, when you're saying, hey, can I meet a surgical endpoint for which we have evidence to, to say that that would be worthwhile? All other variables, age, things like that aside. Um. I didn't spend any time with Dr. Boudreau, so. <laughs> uh, I will just say this, you know, uh, to answer before your, I answer uh, your question, uh, is, you know, most places will have tumor bulbs, but they will present, you know, uh, colon cancer, breast cancer and stuff. We have a dedicated neuroendocrine tumor board, you know, every week, and we have like, you know, at least 10, if not more cases every week. So it's a team sport. You can't beat cancer alone. And, you know, it's a team approach for us. In terms of the surgical debulking, I think uh, both Dr. Bordeaux and I highlighted, I think uh, it's, you know, we take into account various factors and see, you know, uh, whether it's technically feasible. I think in our mind is, is whether we're going to help the patient or harm the patient. I think that's really important for me uh, because the goal is always not just to do surgery is, you know, even though we are in a business of medicine is, is to get them better and what can we achieve. And that's where I think, you know, the team approach is key. But the other important aspect of it is patience, correct? It's not a dictatorship. It's like, you know, you guys need to figure out, you know, uh, and our job is to give you guys all the information and you guys figure out what's the best option for me. Whether it's liver directed therapy or liver surgery and stuff, and every single patient is different. So I think it's a team approach amongst ourselves, but with you guys as well. And that's where it's helpful to just listen, you know, and Dr. Ramirez alluded to this as well is I cannot talk about the chemo aspects of it. I stay in my own lane. I can't talk about the liver-directed aspects of it, but I can talk about the uh, surgical aspects, the pros and cons of it. And uh, so I think one size doesn't fit all with new endocrine tumors. When there are too many options, it just means that you know all of them provide different benefits and different risk. And what works for you guys versus, you know, uh, it's a team decision-making. Good. Okay, okay, and then last but but uh, but not least, before before lunch, it's actually you're going to be the pathologist. Okay, <laughs> so um, so uh, uh, several questions, kind of in your uh, in your area, was one about if you are a certain grade of diagnosis. So say for your your example, grade one, when you recur, do you tend to have a higher grade? So that's one question, and and two, when you're dissecting out all of the stuff in the pathology report, almost beyond what it is that you that you went over, CARE 67 and stuff like that. Someone asked about somomatous calcification, so I think that's just somomatous bodies within your path report, and then what the PT4, PN, what is all that in the pathology report and how does that affect how you interpret it? Sure, great question. So. Um, the, the first, first question, question was about the grade evolution. evolution. So, so yes, the grade can change uh, over a period of time. Uh, you may recur with the same grade or you can recur with a higher grade. Um, even if you have metastatic disease, that can also, the grade can change over a period of time. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, and that, the reason to re-biopsy when, uh, when a situation like that happens is based on how the disease is behaving, you know. So if you were originally diagnosed with um, a grade 1 tumor, uh, but later on your tumor is not behaving like a grade 1 tumor, it's starting to grow faster than what we would expect with the biology of a grade 1 tumor, we would re-biopsy at that time um, to confirm that suspicion. The second question was uh, what we look at in the pathology report. So. We use a staging system called TNM, so it has the three different things. The T is for the tumor, the N4 is, is for the lymph nodes, and the M is for the metastasis. So the pathologist, um, now if you've had a surgery which um, is removing the lymph nodes, you know, it'll, uh, it'll give us these three different components. So the tumor is the tumor size, how deep it is into the other uh, areas or within the organ itself that was resected. The lymph nodes that were taken out, if they were taken out, they would tell us how many lymph nodes were taken out and how many of those are positive. Um, and then the metastasis is more usually determined on the imaging, but can also sometimes be uh, from, uh, depending on the surgery that you've had, uh, we'll look at 
dis spread outside of the organ. So not the organ where it started, not the lymph nodes, but distant organs. So those are the three components we are looking at at a pathology report. Yeah, and the pathology report is based on something that comes out of your body. So that P just means that it's pathology instead of a clinical assessment based on just radiographic imaging. And then the, the T is just going to be the size. And, and But all those N's and the N's actually does matter with prognosis in some cases. So the higher the, the N, then the more likely you, you would have a local regional recurrence. Okay, um, what's our time? Oh, plenty of time. Okay. Oh, well, then that's, that's great. So then um, how about, um, so I think I can answer this when I got into to, um, neuroendocrine doing, uh, advising people on multivisceral organ transplantation. So that is a very, so the question is, what is the role of multivisceral organ transplantation in metastatic uh, neuroendocrine? This one was in particular in pancreatic. So that is a really, really patient-specific, but that compared to 10 years ago when I initially got into to neuroendocrine, when we were really just saying, can we do it? Can we feasibly do it versus should we be doing it under their guidelines? There are actually very good guidelines for metastatic neuroendocrine uh, now, and so even the organ allocation people, who knows, have, have allowed us to identify people that are more or less appropriate. So the vast majority of multivisceral, that is meaning that you are taking out almost every single organ in the body from the half the stomach to half the, the colon. Everything in between is coming out, um, including the pancreas, and you are taking a single donor from here. You're taking the whole kit and caboodle and sewing it, it, it into place. So it is a complicated surgery, and it requires a lot of immunosuppression. But, but the, the immunosuppression, immunosuppression that we use for standard of care neuroendocrine, I mean standard of care transplantation, has not ever been shown to impact the biologic behavior of neuroendocrine. Now, we can't say that in higher grade tumors, so there has to be criteria saying, well, it's got to be pretty low grade where most of the data on immunosuppression and biologic behavior was made. So the vast majority of multivisceral organ transplantations are in metastatic mid-guts. Those are the people that tend to have um, live a really long time and will struggle with the consequences of, of a lot of treatment over 10 to 20 years of time. So usually the decision was being made because they were developing single organ liver failure or, or complications of their intestinal failure, whether or not that be short gut, fistulas, and things like that. So then you'd say, well, pancreatic neuroendocrines are a little bit more complicated. They are biologically unpredictable. And so we, although it has clearly been done, the data on long-term outcomes is just not as good. And obviously it became very controversial since Steve Jobs was, was transplanted with a liver only, even though if the water cooler is, is correct, he had disease elsewhere, meaning they didn't remove all the, all the disease. And, um, and he ultimately then made it very controversial to, to use transplantation for metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So when we were looking at the evolution of that, we have tried to, one, you have to be able to remove all measurable disease, and two, we've gone to something called an upper cluster. And an upper cluster means that you are sparing the intestine, which is the hardest thing when it comes to immunosuppression in a multivis. And, and you're, you're trying, trying to just take, take out the liver and the pancreas that are sort of connected with the bloodstream, but that you can also remove all of those lymph nodes in the area and remove all measurable disease. So the answer to the question is, yes, there are guidelines. The guidelines are actually pretty well established, so it's not as hard to leverage for patients with, you know, bivisceral and upper cluster versus multivisceral. And I think more transplant centers are getting comfortable with the idea. I think we are definitely leaning towards liver only in people that have a long disease interval, and the disease can be removed with the liver you know, only and then some lymph nodes. And so I think it's evolving, but it's very, very patient specific. Okay, so that's the multivisceral thing. Okay, so now I think Garima. Does NETS pass from one generation to another? Is it hereditary? How would we know? And when is genetic testing indicated? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, there are a subset of neuroendocrine tumors that can be uh, inherited. Uh, the most common um, that um, I think one of the surgeons, I think you mentioned in your, in your talk, um, 
uh, about uh, the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, they can be associated with different genetic uh, syndromes. So uh, when you have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, especially at a young age, um, genetic testing is indicated um, at that time. A lot another another time um, uh, these can be inherited is with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas i don't know if anybody here has the diagnosis but um, those um, about actually they have a higher percentage so 30 to 40 percent of those can be inherited so uh, you know if you have one or two of those diagnoses um, genetic testing is indicated okay and then rob ramirez is there a correlation between long-term high serotonin levels and cognition and recall? Interesting question. Uh, um, so, so, um, so, the, so, so, to the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, you know, we think about you know we think about serotonin in the brain, and we also think about serotonin, peripheral serotonin. So, people with the carcinoid syndrome, this is a peripheral serotonin. Uh, Problem, uh, and so that's why that's why you end up with uh, the carcinoid syndrome, and why you end up with carcinoid heart disease. This is also why we can use things like uh, what we call uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors in this disease, because those medicines like Prozac or Zoloft uh, they affect the central serotonin rather than the peripheral serotonin. So um, I don't know if anyone's uh, you know I. You know, I, I guess I don't. I, I defer to you know some of my other uh, experts up here if uh, they have anything anything else to add. No, not much to add. I'm also not aware of any uh, any data that uh, shows uh, impact on uh, cognition. High serotonin levels definitely don't make you happier. That that we do know. Okay, and then lastly, Andrew Marsala, the, the um, concept of a biopsy causing spread of, of tumor, when do we worry about that, and is that relevant in neuroendocrine? We used to worry about it a lot. Um, I mean, back uh, when our techniques were different. So when they first started doing percutaneous biopsies back in the image-guided 80s um, and 90s, they used huge needles, and they didn't use something called coaxial technique. So they would just stab the biopsy gun through the skin into an organ, into the tumor, take a chunk of tumor, and then drag it out. And when they did that, you're, you're talking about a lot of tissue that they were pulling out. And they, um, you know, 14 gauge needles, a big needle. Uh, and they would, they would drag it out, and invariably they would drop a little bit of some tumor cells out along the pathway of the needle. And more often than not, it didn't cause a problem, but um, it did in some patients result in something called tumor seeding. So, which means you dropped a chunk of tumor on the pathway that the needle took, and that tumor took hold and started to grow there. And so um, that became a recognized phenomenon, and the tools got better. And so now we use something called coaxial technique, where you put in a guide needle first. So you, you put in a small guide needle. We're using much smaller tools now, too. So our, our biopsy guns are, you know, 18 gauge. And so you put in a, a guide needle. You take the center of the guide needle out, and then you stick your biopsy gun through the guide needle. You take your cores. And you're, you're dragging those, those cores, the biopsy gun, through the guide needle first. Okay? And then you're putting, when you're done, you're putting the stylet back in the guide needle, and then you're, um, so you're pushing any material in the guide needle back down through the guide needle and out the end of the guide needle, which is still inside the tumor, and then you're pulling that out. And that's a much cleaner way of doing it. Okay? Much cleaner way of doing it. And with things like neuroendocrine tumors, where the tumors are, they're not all low grade, but a lot of them are relatively indolent. Um, Tumor seeding is not common. It's extremely uncommon. I don't want to say it can't happen, but it's so uncommon that we don't think about it very often anymore. Um, yeah, so better technique, better material, you know, and better tools have made it so that this is less of an issue in 2024 than it was in 1984. I would just say this, you know, a lot of the patients will ask, you know, if we do the surgery, the ear is going to hit it and it will metastasize. Actually, that's completely misnomer from surgical standpoint. Most of the time, it's already metastasized. It's just that we are able to visualize it. So the issue there is, is the CT scans, MRI, or PET scans anywhere in the world, they have a size threshold. And uh, anything smaller is not going to be picked up by it. So usual analogy I give to the patients is if I take some ink and I just splatter on the wall, I scan the room, anything object will be bigger than, you know, yay big is going to be picked up by it, but the, not the ink splatter. But when you open the door to a room, you can see the ink splatter. So 
that's another misnomer that uh, the surgery itself will spread the cancer. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. it. I did save um, like the micro-nodules, some of the lung stuff for the afternoon session. One comment about, about tuba boards and, and, and one other observation. So um, in the ideal world, you folks are going to live a long time. And so reevaluation over time is also part of your journey. So a tumor board may meet and decide we're going to do this and this and this, and then some time goes by, one, two, three, four, five years, and what was decided back then may not be relevant to your problem or your situation, you know, one, two, three, four, five years later, because number one, we'll have new tr treatments, new drugs, new techniques, new stuff, and your physiology may have changed, and so reevaluation over time, I think, is important. So just remember that that's kind of going to be part of this ongoing thing. Uh, if you have the opportunity to get reevaluated, reassessed, restaged, if you will, and to Cameron's point, the perfect scan that tells us everything that's going on inside a person hadn't been invented yet. We can only see what we can see down to certain limits of resolution. So sometimes, well, basically, I live about 50% of my time in Plan B because we go to the operating room with a Plan A, we get in there, and we find something just totally different. So you have to kind of readjust, as they say. What's the go with the flow, as they say? And I also want to. Congratulate you folks on being very fortunate to have these two individuals right here who kind of cut their teeth on their endocrine tumors in our shop down in New Orleans, and then you all stole them from us. <laughs> but uh, it's good to spread the knowledge and spread the wealth, and this is kind of the way it's supposed to work. Is it's a, we should be teaching the new generation and, and spreading the knowledge and spreading the expertise so that people don't have to travel as far to get the care they need. And so... Anyway, I just want to let you know I'm, I'm really jealous that they're here. Thank you. Oh, okay. Keep, keep rolling. Is this when they do a song and dance? Yeah, so, so uh, we, are, we do have some time, so if anybody has changed their mind and has a question, just raise your hand. We'll bring a mic over and you can ask the question. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the other people, the other people are not going to hear you. Thank, thank you. Is it on? Um, this is, I guess, a question for all the members of the panel because you all touched on it briefly. Um, my medical oncologist says you should be treated medically because that's the best course for you. My surgical oncologist says you should be treated surgically because that's the best course of medicine for you. My radiology oncologist says you should be treated with, with uh, uh, radio radiological intervention. I've had five different, um, I am undergoing some treatments. I have had five different second opinions, if you will. I've gotten five different answers. Who do I listen to? Part of it is, I think, all of those answers are correct. And they're not necessarily mutually exclusive but complementary. And so you may benefit from all of those different options, and none of them should be to the exclusion of the other. And so anybody that tells you they are is not really understanding the whole depth and breadth of the spectrum of this disease and what's out there and is available. And so it really needs to be a focused answer in your particular case because that's the other thing we know is just like no two fingerprints are the same, no two tumors, biology is exactly the same, and no two person's situation is the same. So um, you do have to have somebody that can take a step back and look at the whole spectrum of options and, and sequence them for you to say, okay, we think that in your situation, this is probably what you ought to do first, which is surgery, as everybody knows. <laughs> Just kidding. But, but all of the things that you've heard about, including PRT, including liver-directed therapy, including, you know, perhaps surgery, and including medical management, are all on the table, and they're not mutually exclusive. And that's about the best answer I can give you at this point without having more data. 
But, but I, can I can also understand, understand how frustrating it is. I, I find it hard to believe that, that, uh, that if you were to go to two neuroendocrine subspecialty centers, you would, would get vastly different opinions. opinions. We may be ever, ever so slightly, slightly philosophically different in the weight that we put on certain things or surgical site of reduction versus maybe other methods. methods. So, so I, I think that you're, you're, you're getting a second opinion is absolutely the correct thing to do. But usually, I think that if you're starting to get mixed messages, I would, I would usually ask the neuroendocrine person, and then I would be able to tell you. Like, like I think Phil and I, and probably the, the, the Rob, Rob too, I can, I can tell you exactly what MD Anderson is going to say. I understand them philosophically. So then people aren't surprised when they go to MD Anderson. But that I, I think that we could help you in that second opinion say, these are the questions that you need to ask that are unique to your case. And I think that in our program, we on our on our treatment notes that you get and the referring physicians get and your primary care physician, it says, these are the features of this case that are supporting these treatment recommendations. And we hand that to you so that you could take it to Anyone, anyone else and say, this is what they're saying. They're, they're saying, these are the features of my case. Can you explain how what you're telling me is, is either congruent or different than what is written down on this piece of paper? And I think all of us that have been in our own for a while, we really you know, feel pretty confident in the data that's driving the medical decisions in particular case. So I can almost feel your frustration in having then seemingly gotten sort of mixed messages. And then you just really aren't sure, like, where, where you fit, like, what is it about your case. case. And, and so, so maybe, maybe it's going to be the sixth opinion in one of these guys. guys. And, and then, then we can define the key questions that you would that you would ask. And, and then there is data to support it. it. It's just that we function on guidelines as opposed to standard paths like colorectal lung or prostate or breast. And so a lot of it is very patient-specific. And I think, you know, you you kind of hit on the point that when you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So your med onc is going to want to treat you medically. Your radonc is going to want to give you radiation. Your nuke med doc is going to want to do PRRT, you know, and, and also, you know, there are, there are differences between the neuroendocrine specialty centers, as, as Dr. Maluccio pointed out. You know, you go to one, you know, we know what you're going to get offered. I mean, we, we, we've seen it, um, you know. I think things change over time, and even you know, even uh, at at our own institution, I think we've evolved, you know, just you know, just over time, and how we how we treat our neuroendocrine patients as we learn more. I think it's a matter of you know recognizing, you know, one center may offer the, you know one particular thing, another center may offer you know another net specialist may offer another thing. And it doesn't mean that they're they're not necessarily wrong. They're you know you can you can achieve the same the, the same outcome by different by different means. You know what's and, and sometimes you got to figure out all right what's best for you, um, and what's uh, you know where do I fit into that and where, what do I feel most comfortable with? Uh, so so some people will say well I want PRT but I only want you know alpha therapy because I heard about this alpha therapy and it's so great and. Uh, uh, well, you know, I think well then then that's that's right for that's right for you. Um, you know, some people will will get a surgical opinion uh, and say, well, I want all of this out, and and maybe that's maybe that's the right thing to do. But maybe at the end of the day, both of those things are are, are the the right thing to to do for you. So, so it really, you know, it really depends on where where you're at, and you got to be comfortable with your with your own decision. Yeah, I, I'm going to speak up just for a second too, because uh, as a as a uh, patient advocate for 20 years, uh, we've seen the paradigm change tremendously, where nobody asked the patient, nobody, and we we went out and it was kind of like being a salesman. We would go to doctors and they would be so passive aggressive about the fact that we would question what was going on. So now. Doctors are coming to patients and saying, well, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. So it's kind of, it's, it's almost like you now have another job, right? You're doing the right thing, right? Everybody here is trying to learn more about their disease. And I can only say that you, you get to weigh the options and uh, decide, you know. It's not, 
I'm not saying it's not a crazy decision. You know, we go we go through the same thing with Marianne, but I think it's a better place to be than to go to a doctor who is going to be uh, basically speak as if they're God, right? And, and you guys understand what I'm talking about. That's not so anymore. I was going to add one thing that I think is specific to your particular case. Um, so if you've got a bunch of providers that are giving you different advice and telling you this is what you need to do, I don't know if they're talking to one another. Because, you know, I don't think any of us on a tumor board are going to contradict the recommendations of another without having a discussion and coming up with a, a, a cohesive synthesis of recommendations and a plan. So when we give recommendations, it's tumor board recommendations. I may give my recommendations if, they're, if, they, if that is what the tumor board decided, right? Does that make sense? But if you've got multiple providers that are giving different recommendations, are they talking? And if they're not talking, they should be, right? Because that, that puts you guys in a tough spot. And I don't know, I think that's why I think multidisciplinary tumor boards are so important with a field like, or the, with a disease process like this, which has a lot of options. And a lot of things that can be done in different orders and, you know, what do we do first? So that's the purpose of the tumor board is so that you don't have to have that situation where a bunch of people are telling you different things. That's the whole purpose of the board. So, anyway. And I'll go into a little bit more detail when I go over the PRT. I think for the surgeons on the, on the panel, I think as we've evolved, more treatment options are available and PRT is now coming out and we're kind of trying to push it up earlier in the disease course. I would say for most surgeons, we would like to at least know that we've seen the thing before someone gets PRT because one, um, if you get PRT, it changes the tissue integrity if we have to go in and operate. So that we would prefer not to have to go in and operate after someone has had PRT. This is particularly relevant in, in pancreatic neuroendocrine when someone will say, oh no, you have metastatic disease and therefore you are surgically incurable or, or untreatable. And so then they will they, they will get, get um, PRT, and, and then for whatever reason, they can get a complication of PRT, or then ultimately they get an opinion, and then they are a surgical candidate. The, the complication rate goes up because the tissue integrity is just not as good. So that I think that the, the surgeons on almost any any tumor board are somewhat sensitive, just like uh, Karen said about, about staying in the lane. We are somewhat sensitive to someone else telling, a non-surgeon telling a patient that they are not a surgical candidate. Or tell a radiation oncologist telling them that you're, they're not a surgical candidate and therefore we're going to do this other treatment. Because that decision does actually impact what it is we can potentially do, either at that point in time or later on, and so I, I do feel like our program, because we're surgically somewhat assertive, are, are probably have the, the highest number of, of cases where people have come in either requiring an operation after PRT or requiring an operation because of complications of PRT because you can't control where the radiation goes, and they can just be messy operations with higher complication rates. So the one thing I would say if the radiation oncologist is saying, oh, I emphatically think that this is the way to go, and a surgeon hasn't put that in perspective for you on what that decision means to go to PRT before considering surgery, that actually does matter to most of the surgeons. And I don't know whether or not, Bill, you are. No, I think, well, one, it's a team sport and you want to go to a place where there's a multidisciplinary approach in which they talk to each other and uh, uh, come up with a unified consensus for you is key. I think the same is true now with immunotherapy for some other cancers too. Uh, and uh, it makes the surgery difficult. So just because you have, you know, unfortunate reality is this, you know, just because you have a toy or treatment, you know, and if you're in the business of medicine, people will make money off of it so just like you know for example i hear patients telling me oh what about proton therapy you know somebody offered me but there's no data but since they have proton therapy they're going to just put on the hell out of whatever tumor you have but that doesn't mean uh it's the right thing to do so i think uh, going to places in which there's a cohesive multidisciplinary approach to patients with neuroendocrine tumor is the way to go about it i think that's the moral of this you know all the talks and the, this discussion uh, up, to, uh, up to now. The other thing is, as I mentioned, some of it is just, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. What's the best 
treatment option at that time for you, correct? Uh, that matters as well. You know, there are patients who just say, hey, uh, even I'm surgical candidate and I don't want surgery, it's not for me, and we respect their wishes, you know. And uh, so I think uh, some of it just depends on, you know, our job is to give you all the information and the pros and cons of it. And, you know, and then as a team, you know, you we figure out, you know, what's the best uh, way to go about treating you. Okay. If there's nothing else, anybody else? Oh. You see, we now people are ready to talk. See that? Thank you. Um, I was diagnosed 39 years ago with MEN1, and I was told I was classic textbook because I had the pituitary, parathyroid, and pancreatic tumors and all surgically um, removed, fixed. I never heard of neuroendocrine tumors until 2018 when some of my blood work um, revealed that I might have had a gastrinoma, I might have had a pheochromocytoma, and I just am not sure, is, is my disease MEN1, is my disease neuroendocrine cancer, is one a result of the other? And um, I guess I'm kind of like in a fog. Plus, there's no, uh, I don't know how my doctor now, is Dr. Wolin at Mount Sinai, we've been unable to get results of my, or the pathologies from my past surgeries because they're so old. So how did we come to knowing I have uh, neuroendocrine cancer? Well, for the syndromes, it's very easy. You know, they don't need the actual tumor tissue. They can just do the testing, you know, uh, with the uh, blood. I think there was a question regarding the familial or hereditary. You know, so uh, I think, uh, you know, places, you know, like at Vanderbilt, you know, will refer you to a high-risk genetics clinic, and they will look at all your history and stuff and then they will test you you know and uh your blood or you know like saliva and stuff and if they find a genetic abnormality uh then you would be you know will be able to diagnose you now you have to remember you know genetic testing is changing as well with time so what was done you know 38 years ago maybe you know really archaic at that time correct so you know uh and uh, probably you know there were some other syndromes that weren't associated with it so i think uh you know uh, uh, probably needs to be revisited, and uh, if you're in the clear, then you know it has implications for your siblings and kids and grandkids as well. So, and, and the, the pancreatic neuroendocrine is a consequence of the MEN mutation. mutation. Yeah. yeah, and, and what, what, he, he, what he said, said is, is that really you, you if, if you, do, you have it, so you, you have it, we call that the prototype. prototype. But, but that, that there's, there's nothing we can do, do about that, that right? right? Other than this. It, it is actually really important for your siblings and your children because subclinical hyperparathyroidism can cause significant bone loss, and it may not be so obvious. And that's a non-cancer diagnosis associated with that, also associated with cancer diagnosis. And so getting into high-risk clinics, which a lot of academic centers would have, is really about making sure that you're, you're plugged in so that we can cover not only the surveillance for the cancer-related problems, but the non-cancer-related problems of which subclinical hyperparathyroidism can be very significant. And, uh, and I'll just add, uh, for the folks in the room who, who don't know what we're talking about, uh, MEN1 uh, stands for multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. There's, there's different types. There's a type 2, there's a type 4 as well. And what they, this is a, these are familial syndromes that, that can predispose to development of these neuroendocrine tumors at various locations. So when we think about MEN1, we, we classically think about abnormalities of the pituitary gland, uh, um, uh, parathyroids being overactive, increasing calcium levels, but also development of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and more. And actually, uh, to be correctly, it's foregut neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, so, so, so I see these things begin in the lung as well. There's a newer entity called MEN4, which, uh, which is a different gene, but it's still a familial syndrome. So, so people develop multiple primary tumors. It's not that they, you know, they, they tend to be slower growing, um, um, but they're all primary tumors. So people can have a, a, a pancreas tumor that we can take out, uh, and then they pop up with a lung tumor. 
It's not related to the pancreas tumor, it's a primary lung tumor. Uh, and so, so it's lifelong surveillance, uh, but it's a, it's a blood test. Um, and, uh, and so those blood tests evolve over time. And, uh, and so it's, you know, if, uh, if it's positive, then we send you to a genetic counselor. And then they talk about, they go through all your family and, and talk about the pros and cons about getting family members tested as well. Uh, because, you know, this is something that earlier we know about this, the, the sooner we can, uh, you know, uh, do something about it.